Hello? Hello? Hello, Antonella, can you hear me? Antonella, can you hear me? Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Come stai? Come stai? Benissimo, grazie. Tu? Bene, bene, grazie. Sei un po' nervoso quando devo parlare. Come, come? Sono un po' nervoso quando devo parlare o devo presentare. C'è una parte timida di me che viene fuori, anche Ma se non no, sembra... Ma no, non è possibile! Eh, sì. lo so, la nascondo molto bene. <ride> ma io scusa se ti ho rotto le scatole con quelli mail, ma no. quindi se le persone fanno delle domande su YouTube o su Facebook, io non le vedo. No, tu non le vedi e non le vedo neanche io, se ti dico la verità. Quindi è tutto, insomma, perché è complicato. E ah, scuola, non è una allora, cosa grave, quindi. Non è per niente una cosa grave. Quindi lascia perdere, non, non commentare neanche la storia di, di Facebook. Lo di, dico io che siamo su Facebook, che poi oggi abbiamo avuto... Aspetta un attimo che mi sta scrivendo. Sì, sì. Abbiamo avuto dei problemi con Facebook, che non siamo connected da oggi, però comunque si sta... Adesso, adesso sta, si sta um, registrando, si sta recording questa sessione. Mm. E quindi, anche se non è su Facebook live... Dopo eh, quello che faranno è che lo, lo, lo metteranno su YouTube comunque e così potranno vedere. Ho capito perfettamente, grazie. Aspetta che ascolto i messaggi che mi sta mandando Sì, Adria. sì, certo. Un attimo, eh. Allora. Perfetto. Perfetto. Ma in questo momento sta registrando anche adesso, inizia alle 5. Uh, aspetta, scusa. Prego, prego. Ok, no, sì, sì, eh, sì però, però non ti preoccupare, quello che stiamo, la nostra chiacchierata, <ride> spero che... Non verrà E non la metteranno <ride> su YouTube. <ride> Come. Comunque, senti, come stai? Tutto, tutto a posto? Abbastanza bene, abbastanza sì? bene. Lì a Bologna come vanno le cose? No, abbastanza bene, non fa neanche freddo. Non fa neanche bene. freddo. Bene. Tu sei in Germania, se non ho capito male. Io sono in Germania, sì, sono a Colonia adesso. E, e ovviamente non, non ho potuto andare a... Non sono potuto andare a Madrid eh, per, per, per la conferenza e quindi adesso... Eh, sì, immagino sia, insomma preoccupante sì, e pericoloso per tutti, no? È un po' pericoloso per tutti e mi, mi succedeva un po' come, come a te, sai, fino all'ultimo momento pff, non sapevo sì. bene se... Cosa sì, Emanuele ma... è stato veramente carino a dirmi che mi, avrebbe, sì. che mi avrebbe acquistato il biglietto, ma io mi sentivo un certo. po' spaventato, certo. una forma di cautela se vogliamo. Ma sì, ma sì, ma hai fatto, ma hai fatto benissimo perché adesso non... Adesso le cose si stanno complicando ancora di più, no? In Italia è un po' dappertutto, quindi è meglio stare tra sì. tranquilli e fare tutto online. E... Anche perché non è così difficile. No, no, non è così difficile. Beh, abbiamo imparato tanto. Questo... Io ho imparato un sacco adesso di... a fare queste mm. cose qua e vedo che Beh, la cosa super positiva è che... è che funziona anche molto bene, che può essere... Ovviamente non è la stessa cosa che, che... che vedere le persone... No, in persona, però certo. funziona bene lo stesso e... Ah, ecco, aspetta, scusami, che there is a... Sì, sì, è arrivato uno dei nostri, no? Lo, <ride> lo, lo accolgo anch'io. Hello Bradley, nice to meet you. Buenas, buenas tardes, come stai? <laughs> Quite well, we were speaking Italian, actually. No ah, worries. ok. That was okay. Italian, but we both speak Spanish too, no worries at all. <laughs> ok. Yeah. How are you, Bradley? So, so where, where are you joining us from? Um, Montreal. Montreal, okay. And in Montreal, it's uh, almost noon here. Okay. And, uh, it's about zero degrees. Oh gosh, so, already? Yeah, Oof. it's a little chilly. Yeah. Very chilly. <laughs> and where are you guys? Um, well, ladies first, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Saul. I'm in Cologne, in Germany. Ah, ok. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm in Bologna, Italy. All right. All right. Mm. Which so, is my city, actually. Yeah. yeah it's uh, tragic. We're not in Madrid today. But, yeah, uh, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> it's very unfortunate. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. It's very different doing the conference this way because um, well, I'm an administrator and it was really hard to block off this hour and a half period. Oh, yeah. So it's impossible, literally impossible for me to intend, attend any other session. So it's... Uh, oh, what a shame. But, yeah. but Bradley, you'll be able to, to see some of the sessions um, later on, you know, on YouTube or, or right. Facebook. So we will send you all the, all the links. So if you are interested to, to listen to the other, the other sessions. Oh, that'd be great, actually. So um, yeah, I didn't know that they're, that they're going to be um, recorded. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bradley, while we are, you know, while we, we, we still have 10 minutes before, before starting, did you want to try and, and you know, uh, share your screen? You want to check? Yeah, that's a very good. That's a very good idea, actually. I don't, I don't have a PowerPoint. Ah. I'm just, uh, I'm just going to read. Okay. And, uh, read okay, no worries at all. No problem. That sounds read. great, actually. I like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like it very much, yeah. I do do PowerPoints from time to time, but um, anyway, for this occasion, I, I, I never plan to use it, so anyway. <laughs> yeah, so I hope they arrive a little earlier, I mean, before the presentation. So I can ask Valerie how to pronounce the first word of her, of her paper, Indigenx, what is that? <laughs> do you know what that is? Uh, Val Valerie's paper, e Indigenous Futurisms. How do you even pronounce that? <laughs> I think like you've just done it now. I don't know. I would say the same maybe thing. It's, maybe it's Indigenex, maybe. Indigenex, is it? All right, that's a good point. I'll ask her. Okay. She... Otherwise, I'll, I'll take your hint and just say Indigenex. <laughs> 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 so I'm not familiar with that line because of research. We... They have that, um, you know, instead of saying Latino or Latina, they're saying now Latinx. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That is the politically correct kind of idea, isn't it? Actually, it's not at all. If you ask actual Hispanics, they hate it, right? Yeah, so, I've heard of that, but it's it's portrayed as such, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I understand, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good, good. Uh, so we're yes. four in total. Uh, no, yeah, it should be. Yeah. You are only three, three panelists, and and Saul, the the moderator. So we should finish, probably, uh, you know, a, a bit earlier than um, than the, the the session. Yeah, a bit earlier um, because there are only three three panelists. Um, but that's not a problem because then we have uh, the closure of the of the conference. So. You know, uh, and so we're uh, like the last panel. Sorry, are we, are we the last panel? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> you are, but in parallel sessions, as you know, that there are, right. yeah, yeah, there yeah, is yeah. another one online in Spanish, and there is one also on site. So we have three wow. parallel sessions. Um, and you know the format, no, of this of of the session. I don't know, uh, Saul, if you want to explain how you know we will do. Yeah. So basically, this is strict uh, twenty minutes. Uh, <laughs> if you don't oh, stick yeah. to the time, it's very very bad. And unfortunately, <laughs> it's my duty to tell you off. So that's very embarrassing. Yeah, I'm no, the bad guy I today, usually, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I usually come up a little short on time, so. So maybe I'll, I'll do this. When it's 18, 18 minutes, uh, I'm just going to tell you one minute to go. So that's, this, but I'm sure you're going to be fine. And the same applies to everybody else. We've been democratic here. Yeah, so that's it. 20 minutes for the paper and 10 minutes for the questions. Is that correct, Antonella? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I mean, what else is missing? Uh, I just I, I introduce the person. I say Bradley Nelson is a professor of Spanish. Uh, blah, 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 and then I'll just introduce the paper as well. Francisco Garcia Gonzalez and the myth of the endless revolution. Is that it? Excellent. Yeah, yeah. and then it just, Perfect. you talk and, and start, make comments. I'll start, my, I'll start my timer and I'll, and I'll go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it would be fine.
Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering what the other ones are. Where are they? Yeah. They're late, aren't they? Yeah. Only five because minutes. didn't we say 15 minutes before the yeah. yes, session? Yes, I guess. I don't know. I think Valerie, I can't remember where she's where she is, uh, where she will be doing it. There we are. There's somebody. Oh, okay. Let me see because Valerie. Oh, hi. Hello, Valerie. Nice to meet hi, you. Hello. Hi, we Valerie. Can, we can't hear you. Hello. <laughs> Wait, can you can you speak? <laughs> Yeah, okay, sorry. Ah, okay, so maybe. Hmm. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, yes. perfect. Yeah. Hello, nice no? to meet you. Can yes, you yes. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah. Good morning. Hello, nice to meet you. Hello there. Good nice evening for you. us. Good yeah, evening. indeed. Good yeah. Where, where are you? <laughs> I'm sorry. Where are you? It's morning. Where am I? I'm in uh, Southern California. Uh, okay. So, uh, so what time is it there? 9 a.m. Okay. <laughs> oh, there you are. It's there you are. Actually, almost six here. Uh, oh, okay. Europe, yeah. Well, good evening. It's really good to uh, be here and um, you. meet you. <laughs> yeah, likewise. So oh, I've just funny. learned that is indigen X, is it? Indigen X is the pronunciation. Is. Yes. All right. <laughs> Bradley yes, was it. very kind to teach me that. <laughs> I didn't know how to pronounce that. It is. It is. It, uh, it, may I ask you um, before we start? So UC Berkeley, shall I just pronounce it like that, right? I just yes. say UC Berkeley. Shall I, shall I just uh, uh, say MFA UCLA like that? Or should I define what that is? That's fine. That's, That's perfect. fine. I'm not very familiar with all the. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering. I didn't want to make mistakes. No, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you thank for asking. Yeah, and, I was wondering. You know, Antonella, I thank you so much for all of your um, assistance and support. Mm. And I, I'm so sorry that I miss sending you like abstracts and things. I'm really sorry. No problem, no problem, Valerie. No, I hope no. I didn't cause that's, you. That's, a... that's what we are here for. So absolutely no problem. I'm very right. happy that uh, yeah that you all managed to join today. It's 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 great. It's fantastic. Um, so let's see if uh, there are only a few minutes left. Let's see if um, yeah. Anna Martin uh, joins us. I don't know. If maybe yeah. she's in before the... she arrives. Uh... Uh, I'll just tell Valerie it's 20 minutes for the paper. I, uh, we need to be quite strict with that and 10 minutes for the questions. Okay, so great. I'll Thank be the bad guy telling you know, off. Uh, it's already a done deal. I'm the bad guy today. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my, my apologies. Uh, I'll have I, to stop you if you go. Very yeah. helpful. And um, if I start talking and I, it looks like I'm getting close, can you just give me like, I don't know, like a high sign or I can, I can also time it on my side. Yeah, well, I'm going to time it. I'm going to tell you at a minute 18, two minutes before uh, the end. Is that okay? That's great. All right, cool. That's perfect. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, so the only person missing is Ana Martin Castillejos. Yes, I'm just going to check it if uh, maybe Adrian knows um, if he's heard from her. May I ask where you all are today? I'm <laughs> yeah. in Montreal. Montreal. And I wish I was there too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and, in Bologna. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. You've been there? I have not. I have not been. Come anytime. Be I hope to come. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I would love to come. And Antonella, you're in Madrid? No, well, I was supposed to be in Madrid, but uh, I'm, I live in Germany and I couldn't travel. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, I'm, I'm here in Cologne, uh, yeah. Germany. But, uh, but with, I mean, oops, let me see. But I'm glad we can yeah. connect. <laughs> Uh, let me see what 
Ah, okay. So Adrian is saying that we can start uh, when we want because I think that um, uh, that our last speaker, Ana Martin Casillejos, might join us a bit later. So we go ahead as planned. Okay. If she joins, she will. I will put her in the panelist. All right. I, I will be. I will be around. Uh, I'll just uh, mute my. Yes, you need to mute your um, silence. And your microphone while the speaker gives his, his, his presentation. Do I also need to do that? Uh, yes, yes. Well, why? Okay, why so I just press on mute when the speaker is presenting. Is that exactly. correct? Right. See you I'll later. Bye. Yeah, see you, Antonella. Thank you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Welcome, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce you today. Uh, so the first speaker is going to be um, Professor Bradley Nelson. Uh, he's a professor of Spanish and an associate dean in the School of Graduate Studies at Concordia University and author of The Persistent of Presence, Emblem and Ritual in Baroque Spain, and co-editor of Writing in the End Times, Apocalyptic Imagination in Hispanic Cultures. So uh, Professor Nelson today will present a paper entitled Francisco Garcia Gonzalez on the Myth of the Endless Revolution. So please start. Thank, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's great to be here in my stepdaughter's room and in Madrid at the, at the same time. Um, uh, this Most of what I'm going to um, share with you today is, is part of an introduction to an anthology of short stories, science fiction short stories written by the Canadian Cuban author Francisco Garcia Gonzalez <clears throat> that, uh, that I have translated and that will be coming out with uh, the University of Vanderbilt Press. And so I wrote a, an introduction to that and, and, and part of what I'm going to read today comes from, from that introduction. So it's uh, not a lot of work has been done on Francisco's work, hardly none that I know of. And so this is also um, hopefully a little bit of a coming out party for him in terms of uh, his being recognized by, by scholars. Uh, and, and criticism, which I think he is richly deserving of um, because he's a brilliant writer. <clears throat> he actually was a, a master's degree student of mine. Um, and, and it was uh, based on some of those courses that we, that we dreamed up this project. And, and, I, and I thankfully got to get to know him as a, as a fiction writer. Anyway, by the time we, we met, uh, Francisco Garcia Gonzalez had already published several collections of short stories in his native Cuba. Uh, the United States and Canada, as well as co-authoring a humorous and devastating ironic history of Cuba with uh, NYU professor Enrique del Risco called Leve Historia de Cuba, uh, which in English is a light history of Cuba or history light. Uh, a fair number of these stories along with an almost completed novel are science fiction. Um, although they are not sci-fi in the conventional sense, his sideways, sideways approach to sci-fi is one of the main reasons I believe that more readers should become acquainted with his writing, Spanish and English readers alike. If sci-fi is often characterized by the detail and plausible manner in which its creations develop their projections of scientific and anthropological progress or regression, Garcia Gonzalez's stories stand out due to the stark and schematic nature of the temporal, political, and personal predicaments his protagonists face and endure. Short fiction does not allow one the luxury of delving too deeply into contextual details in general, but these stories drop you into an unfamiliar world and expect you to swim, and swim you do. I liken them to the thought experiments that a writer like Neil Stevenson includes in his vast works of speculative fiction. The last story in the first section of my anthology, which I mentioned, um, The Visit, comes from Garcia Gonzalez's anthology, The Walking Immigrant, which is written in Spanish, even though the title is in English, which takes the reader on an anthropological journey through the author's difficult first years in Canada after having emigrated from his native Cuba. It begins with an epigra epigraph from Luis Cernuda's simultaneously melancholic and defiant poem, Peregrino, and the aesthetic and moral framework signaled by Cernuda's elevation of the dignity of the political refugees' flight and fight for survival is strengthened and expanded in the first story of the collection, 
which foregrounds the painful dichotomy of a writer and former academic who has to put down his pen in order to concentrate on his material survival, but who cannot turn off his artistic and anthropolo anthropologically inclined gaze. Its 16 stories chart a course that begins with the desperation and exhaustion of a recent immigrant, both condemned and liberated to take on and survive the most menial, physically demanding and precarious jobs in a confusing metropolis, Toronto, and then moves inexorably through familiar and estranging encounters with immigrants from other places and other personal circumstances. It culminates with a series of run-ins with and between native born Canadians whose loneliness and desperation seem to equal if not exceed that of the immigrant, if only because there's no easy explanation for their emotional and psychological displacement and loneliness. The story included here, The Visit, appears towards the end of the anthology. And as the only sci-fi story in the collection, it takes a more indirect and confusing trajectory to the empathic experience of the reader or viewer in this case. In the story, a pair of intergalactic reapers harvest memories from recently annihilated worlds on the periphery of the cosmos to be sold for consumption by wealthy necrophiles of a galactic metropolis, beings easily recognizable as collectors of antiquities, art, or folk art from absent and disappearing worlds. In other words, uh, sort of macabre eco-tourists. In the end, it is an unflattering self-portrait of the reader hoping to acquire or take possession over an authentic cultural otherness who finds instead his own emptiness and desire for something more real than the memories and lives that postmodernity has offered up, in spite of a ceaseless series of testimonies from a violated diaspora. As the reapers uncomfortably watch one of the memories they have collected, one which they both recognize will be censored and disappeared due to the disruptive power of its personal and intimate nature, Garcia Gonzalez unveils the true power of his art, which memorizes, mesmerizes and humanizes at the same time. The last five stories in the collection and the main subject of this talk come from the 2015 anthology El Año del Cerdo, or the Year of the Pig, under the heading Ucronias. I probably don't have to explain it to this audience, but Ucronia describes a sci-fi genre in which we encounter a contemporary world, but one in which a major historical event has not turned out in the way we assume that it has. My first knowledge of the genre dates back to a story called Ucronia by the Spanish author Manuel Palens, uh, which um, centers on uh, the general Francisco Franco as he's signing a series of death warrants uh, for political prisoners in, um, in, in early nationalist Spain. In the story, uh, a, a slow drop uh, literally of shit from the ceiling turns into a deluge and washes Franco and his regime right out the door of his office. Uh, and that was my first experience with Ucronia. An aesthetic extension of chaos theory's butterfly effect as introduced by the mathematician Henri Poincaré and developed later by Edward Lawrence. Some of the more recognizable Ucronias include Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle and Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale and its follow-up testaments. But I should back up a bit since both the author and the stories in El Año del Cerdo are Cuban, although the author wrote them in Canada and they were published in Miami which boasts the largest population of Cuban Americans in the US. It is worthwhile noting that El Año del Cerdo came after The Walking Immigrant, whose stories as described above document in both familiar and, disturb and disturbingly unfamiliar ways, the author's encounters with and attempts to understand and integrate into Canadian society. I also think it's significant that The Walking Immigrant was written in Spanish by a Cuban Canadian because it reminds Canadians both of their official bilingualism, as well as the fact that their comparatively open immigration policy produces a polyglot, polyglot reality that exceeds any attempt to organize it into official or unofficial categories. Perhaps unintentionally, the official bureaucratic term for this, at least in Quebec, is allophony or other speak producing echoes of otherness and othering that resonate not only through the immigration process, but in the native born Canadian political terrain, which 
just like any other national body is crisscrossed with divergent histories, traditions, and notions of identity. What stands out in The Walking Immigrant are both moments of mutual incomprehension between the immigrant and the native. And I also realize here that the word native resonates dissonantly in a country that is struggling mightily and violently with truth commissions and movements and policies for reconciliation that are trying to respond to the violent and prejudicial treatment inflicted, including today, on indigenous individuals and populations. The point of this small digression is that the author turned his critically aesthetic eye towards his visceral experience with experiences with geographical and cultural dislocation in Canada um, before turning his attention back to his native Cuba. What is obvious in El Año del Cerro is that Garcia Gonzalez's vision as an artist is at one and the same time serene and devastating, pitiless, I would even call it, particularly where the economic and social conditions of his patrimony are concerned. The tone that reigns in El Año del Cerro especially the five sci-fi stories that make up the Ucronias, is naivete, starting with the temporal structure of the stories, which takes the permanent revolution at its word by imagining life under the revolution some three to 500 years into the future. Each story comes from the point of view of a character who is either too young to realize the gravity of the cultural practices, violence, and conflicts that surround them, or too innocent in moral and political terms to comprehend how deep the structural and historical hole they are stuck in really is. Of course, innocence is one of the fallback tropes of science fiction, whether it is the childlike innocence of the newly discovered yet hopelessly backward races uh, that are discovered by the uh, incredibly technologically advanced and sophisticated alien visitors. You can think of Star Trek, uh, which sort of mimics the uh, the, the structure of the Western in the, uh, in the encounter between the cowboy uh, and the Indian, or even Columbus's diaries, which do the same thing in the, <clears throat> in the late 15th century. Um, or even the narcissistic innocence of the space travelers who are completely out of touch with the violent implications of their incursions into newly discovered alien civilizations or their enslavement of beings that they themselves, they themselves have created, as we're gonna see later in this panel in Blade Runner, Runner at least I hope. Um, all of these stories feature shocking plot twists that the reader intuits but does not want to fully embrace because of their horror. The Year of the Pig, the first story follows a young married man as he accompanies his father-in-law, the family patriarch, to Oriente to select the live grade A meat to be roasted on a spit during the annual celebration of the glorious revolution. We, empath we empathic empathetically accompany the, this heir through a number of rites of passage, including his first and successful killing of the beast that will be slaughtered, marinated, roasted over an open pit, and eaten. Those familiar with similar celebrations will recognize the various uses to which the meat, blood, and organs of the beast are put, while kids run around the yard or prod and torture the beast who's in a cage, and the women prepare everything that will accompany the feast. A particularly poignant moment occurs when the son-in-law shoes the kids away when they violently poke the creature with a stick. We're starting to intuit that something is radically wrong with this picture at this moment. Later, as the men sit around the spit slicing holes in the carcass so that the marinate will soak into the flesh, they discuss their island's history, including periods of male and female slavery uh, due to the famous embargo, which has also continued three to 500 years into the future. The faith that the material conditions on the island have deteriorated for over 500 years, even as cultural rituals carry on, cast a dystopian hue over the perpetual revolution. And the true horror, and I can give you guys the spoilers here, which I, which I hold back in my, in my introduction, because I want the readers to read the stories, uh, the horror here comes from our realization that it is not a pig that they are eating, but another human being uh, from Oriente. Um, but the, the, and so the structure is this, this traditional going to the, to the corral, selecting the meat, and then you realize at the end of the story, right, in sort of uh, Twilight Zone fashion, that, uh, that they're going to eat uh, another human being. 
Waiting for the Cart, the second story offers an even more bleak picture in its portrayal of a society in which human males have been completely replaced by clones, while females have all but disappeared, female cloning not having proven successful for some unexplained reason. The plot of this story turns around a series of dialogues between five or six Guajiro clones, farmer clones who are waiting in the town square for the arrival of a caravan carrying one of the few real live female humans left in the universe. Uh, these two or three female subjects uh, travel the universe, uh, visiting different cooperatives uh, where uh, selected um, outstanding male workers uh, can see the spectacle of a real live female. Their debates over the characteristics and humanity of human females are as hilarious as they are bereft of theoretical or practical knowledge. Again, here's where the naivete comes into play. Uh, the idea that the number and weight of misogynistic myths exist in inverse relation to the existence of actual human females is not surprising. However, the gradual erasure of the borderline between human and non-human intelligence and bestiality is brilliantly conceived and executed to the very mysterious end of the story. You see these farmers compare what they imagine a real human female would be like with their own domestic partners uh, in, in great and sometimes excruciating detail. These partners being uh, a goat, two sheep, a cow, a horse, uh, and another um, male clone. Um, and so the line between human and, and animal is, is really um, violated, um, much as it is in the previous story. Uh, any idea of human progress is obliterated when the caravan arrives looking like something out of George Miller's Mad Max uh, Fury Road. In Why Dogs Bark at the Moon, Garcia Gonzalez displaces the journey of the third world refugee several centuries into the future where hastily assembled and fragile spacecraft replace the dangerous aquatic crafts that transport desperate people whose homelands no longer offer them a safe or secure place to live. On the one hand, the extension of the Cuban political predicament several centuries into the future lays bare the relentlessness of its current political and economic isolation. And at the same time, the descent into the mentality and experience of hope, fear, desperation, and sometimes relief brings the reader along for a harrowing and empathetic voyage in which the principal discovery is the experience of and communion with the other. One of the more interesting aspects of this story is the seeming complicity of the US military with the refugees predicament, even though its base of operations has moved to the moon. <clears throat> Yusnavi, the eclipse of a star, narrates the rise and fall of Yusnavi, which comes from US Navy. His mom loved the sound of Yusnavi, which she saw on a military ship uh, when, when Yusnavi was born. The rise and fall of Yusnavi, the orange picker Martinez, a baseball pitcher who is discovered by a failing minor league team manager amongst the migrant farm worker slaves working in the orange groves. The existence of slavery in the distant future is a persistent theme throughout these stories and of course highlights the persistence of the practice in, in, in our neoliberal and neo-global uh, world. And the narrative and thematic return to the importance and normalcy of human tracking and trafficking and slavery in the distant future once again deconstructs myths of historical project, progress, and human evolution. This story can claim kinship with movies like Rocky or the Jackie Robinson story, or even I, Tanya in the way it follows Yusnavi's rise and eventual fall. As is the case with the other generic frameworks in the anthology, however, both the cultural myths that surround the protagonist of the athletic Cinderella story and the aura that surrounds ath athletic prowess itself are simultaneously dismantled and reassembled in masterfully, I would even say Cervantine fashion to unveil the societal that emptiness and economic violence that fuel professional sports, not to mention the fanaticism of the enthusiasts. An ironical appearance of the Ku Klux Klan adds to the strangeness and power of this dystopian future world as strangely enough, they help negotiate Yusnavi's 
um, breaking of his contract with the with the um, Orange Growers uh, Association, so that he can become a professional athlete. It's a it's a very strange moment. Um, the last story in the subsection in the anthology follows a provincial coordinator one for minute. one of the committees. Mm, yep, Sorry. for one of the committees for the defense of the revolution. One Camilo Ortiz as he solicits contributions for the celebration marking the 500th anniversary of the CDRs. Um, this plot here brings us back to the first one, and I'm going to rush through here because because uh, I need to close. Um, but in this case, uh, the donations he's soliciting are. Uh, limbs from the um, people that he visits in the various households, which brings us back to the uh, cannibalistic um, metaphor from the opening story. Um, um, uh, neither the author nor the reader escapes Garcia Gonzalez's penetrating ir irony and empathic understanding, which is why I have in other publications compared the spirit and sly literary and cultural erudition of his fiction with that of Miguel de Cervantes. One of the more distinguishing features of Garcia Gonzalez's fiction is what William Eggington describes as a reality bleed. His fictional stories bleed into the way we perceive and understand how our own worlds are assembled and maintained, penetrating the illusions that sustain our sense of reality. What he shows in other words, as do directors like Ridley Scott and authors such as Margaret Atwood, is that we're already living in a new Ukrainian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, exactly the twenty minutes. That was very good. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is it was really very interesting. Actually, I wasn't familiar with Francisco Garcia Gonzalez and uh, all these ideas about memory and other languages, allophones, which is actually a term borrowed from linguistics, isn't it? And uh, and the idea of cannibalism is very very interesting and. Uh, I'm just wondering what our other colleagues do think about it. So uh, questions are open right now. Any questions, please, or comments, perhaps? Write them in the chat, please. Silence, nobody's asking questions. <laughs> well, I was wondering actually, maybe somebody will, oh, there's somebody here, Metka. Uh, okay, uh, ladies first. Uh, so uh, I read the question, please. Uh, so what mythical structures do you denote in this writing? Um, yeah, I'm, my speaker's on, okay. Um, um, the, the main mythical structures that I allude to uh, although I don't think that I really define them or delve into them very profoundly. Uh, one um, is, as in the title, the myth of the perpetual revolution, right? The, the idea that the revolution remakes itself and improves itself as, as it moves through history. Um, others of the, of the myths that, um, that, that Garcia Gonzalez often confronts are, are myths of uh, historical progress, right? Which I think is one of the the central myths of, of many sci-fi um, sci uh, films, novels, the idea that uh, as techno technology progresses, so too um, does humanity, right? And, and, and by bringing, um, bringing humanity uh, back to so-called barbaric practices in the very celebration of the, the historical persistence and progress of the revolution. I think that Garcia Gonzalez pretty much uh, erases that um, and certainly problematizes it. Okay, so there is another question. I'll just read it. I have from mm -hmm. uh, uh, Anna Paris Rodriguez. Uh, I have a question about the man from Oriente, uh, the one they eat. Is it a way to see the other as a monster, as an animal at least? Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm looking forward to reading Francisco Garcia's work. Uh, and mm. after that, I'll read a comment by Metka, which appeared just afterwards. So first, the question from Anna, please. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, well, Oriente, and these are from conversations with, with Francisco as I was working with him on, on the translations. Um, 
um, as my uh, references to Cervantes might reveal, I'm more of an early modern scholar, right? Uh, I would say 99% of my publications and presentations are on uh, golden age and Baroque um, Hispanic literature. Um, um, but I thought Francisco's work was important enough uh, to take a, a, a wide detour, right, um, from, my, from my work. Um, uh, Oriente is, is um, sort of a, um, it's a peripheral zone in Cuba and, and um, you know, an excluded uh, area, uh, much, not, not so different from sort of indigenous uh, reservations in, in countries like Canada or the US. Uh, even so, um, um, uh, people from, men in particular, were brought from Oriente into the city to act as, as police, right? And so they found them useful. Uh, in a certain sense, uh, to to police the population, perhaps because of their their otherness, right? Um, I don't. I, I think that the monstrosity or bestiality that that Garcia Gonzalez consistently displays in his fiction is not that of the other, but that of the self, right? Mm -hmm. It is um, what what what's so horrifying is the normalness, right, of uh, capturing. Uh, um, sort of methodically slaughtering, dismembering, um, marinating and cooking and then consuming, right? Uh, another human being, right? And this is, I think, this is the bestiality. And, and it is this bestiality that Garcia Gonzalez links to the political um, persistence, right? Of, of the Cuban revolution, right? That is the actual machine, right? That is consuming humanity as he makes crystal clear in the last story with the with the agent who goes from house to house uh, collecting literally limbs right and and each family has a quota of limbs that throughout their lifetime they need to sacrifice right to this um, uh, ritualistic uh, self immolation self consumption you know uh, um, uh, in 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 the revolution. Okay, so, um, so sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. So I have a few questions in here, quite a few. <laughs> so basically, um, if I may, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, so Matka made a comment, which is also a question. Um, sorry, I just read that afterwards. Uh, myths are the deep-seated beliefs then, thinking of not a fry. Would you agree with that? Um, I'm looking, I'm actually following down the comments. If everyone's looking, looking at the comments, I'm reading my, reading them myself. I, I would yeah. say, I, I would agree with, with the, with Leon Burnett's assessment of that as, as, um, myth as, as a cultural belief system, or even as an unconscious, uh, um, um, belief system as well. Right. Um, as I said, the sense of, of human progress, uh, other, you know, other myths that sustain our exceptional um, moral uh, and intellectual status by comparison uh, with other species on the planet. Um, you know, I don't know if any of you have seen recently my, my octopus teacher, but that in a much more uh, elevating and liberating way um, 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 creates the same breakdown of, uh, of, of exceptionality between humanity and other species on the planet. So um, I would say yes um, to that. Um, uh, do you think the satire of the author's fiction targets more Cuban revolutionary illusions or Canadian superiority preconceptions? Um, I, I don't, I think that I think that Garcia Gonzalez, you know, I, I think that um, I think he, his fiction pokes and provokes in all of those directions at the same time, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, I don't know that he would target the Cuban revolutionary illusions any more than any other revolutionary illusions, right? Um, I think that in terms of Canadian superiority preconceptions, it would be the same thing as the superiority preconception that the family who is consuming another human being in, in El Año del Cerdo 
that would be that kind of, of preconception as well, mm. right? So, um, um, I, I, you know, and another reason I want his work to get read is that he's extremely erudite, but in a very kind of sneaky way. It's not obvious, right, to the casual reader, all of the cultural references and literary references and, and cinematic references, because he's also a, a screenwriter, right? Um, that, that pours through his fiction. Um, uh, and so I'm, you know, just sort of tapping, uh, you know, at the, at the very surface of what I'm hoping will be, you know, a much more um, enduring and, uh, and, and engaging um, <clears throat> uh, encounter with, with, with Francisco, um, with Francisco fiction, with Francisco's fiction. Um, and I just want to quickly um, um, comment on the last comment. It sounds a bit harsh to read, but still completely fascinating. Um, you know, my experience in, as, as, a, as a Spanish literary scholar has, has brought me into contact with, with some very dark senses of humor. And, and I would uh, include Pedro Almodovar and Miguel de Cervantes, uh, Jorge Luis Borges, amongst the kinds of authors that, that cultivate a very dark uh, sense of humor. Guillermo del Toro is another one, right? Yeah. And, and so and not to put all Hispanic authors and, 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 and filmmakers into the same bag, but there is a very dark sense of humor um, that in English, um, uh, you also get perhaps in writers like Edgar Allan Poe, right? Um, or David Foster Wallace. And, and yes, it's harsh, um, but I think uh, well worth uh, well worth the effort. Anyway, thank you all. Uh, I this was really uh, a very precise, sharp to the minute. Very good. Thank you very much <laughs> for your illuminating paper. Also for reading the questions. It was a bit confusing to read them and then uh, questions coming in and so on and so forth. That was very good. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Nelson. So the next speaker is um, Valerie Thomas. Uh, she's a Phoebe Estelle Spalding Professor of English and formerly Africana Studies, Pomona College, Claremont College's Consortium, Claremont, CA, um, there's like USA 91711, I'm not sure what that means, my apologies, PhD, UC Berkeley, uh, 1999, MFA, UCLA, Film TV, 1989, MA, UC Berkeley, 1990, Thesis, Mythic Realism in Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon. And uh, today, um, uh, Valerie is going to talk uh, to talk about indigenous ex futurisms in the time of vertigo, shifting ontologies of love and diaspora. Please go ahead. And everybody else should mute their microphones, please. Thank you, Saul, and uh, thank you for that paper, Bradley. So we're going to have some things to talk about. I look forward to your to the anthology very much. Um, Hi everybody, um, happy to be here speaking today. Um, and I, uh, just as we go in, first want to acknowledge that um, I am speaking from the lands of the Quiche and Tongva indigenous people in Southern California, what is now known as Southern California. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, so this is a project that is uh, kind of in development. It's related to work I've been doing on the concept of um, social and cultural vertigo and um, building on, on some work that I've done in the past, but this is definitely kind of going off in a new direction. So thank you for just bearing with me. Um, I think I wrote about, I'm gonna talk about 25 different things in this talk today and in my abstract. And I realized I might talk about two texts. So um, more to come, but uh, what I'm doing is theorizing diasporic self in vertigo. And in terms of diasporic displacement, I refer to the material and epistemic violence of geographic, social, cultural, and psycho-spiritual dispossession, disorientation, feeling that we or the world, or maybe both at once are upside down, adrift, spinning out. And um, of course, 
I'm thinking of um, historic diasporas, but also of um, you know the current state that we're in, of course, with various kinds of um, cataclysms that are um, now in process in which you often will hear us uh, speaking in those terms, in the language of uh, things are upside down, things are spinning, uh, we are disoriented, and, and so on, on an ongoing basis. Um, with the writers and artists I'm investigating, I consider diasporic self transformative being and place configured on a myth-based conception of love and being that is proleptically intertwined with anxieties toward the crisis of uncertain futures, genocide and apocalypse. And I would um, put forward here the kind of, a, there's a central sort of premise in Afrofuturism, um, which is a term that came into being around the, the mid 1970s um, uh, that, we are already in apocalypse. So that in, in terms of the, the black science fiction and black speculative um, conception of the world and conception of history, uh, there's some reconfiguration going on around the idea that um, things like colonialism, things like invasion, things like genocide um, are in fact an ongoing place and temporality of apocalypse that we are uh, living in, in coexistence with, uh, you know, other, other cultural narratives that, that stand with a kind of fear of impending apocalypse. And so there's a kind of already in, in, a tension embedded there around just what and where apocalypse is and how we are in relation to it. Um, these works register the need to lay the imaginative groundwork for improvisationally agile ontologies, adeptness at negotiating borders and thresholds, thresholds and change, and developing interstitial agency, um, and the ability to engage with decolonial futurities that imagine healing, repair, and an ethos of care infused social lives in spite of and beyond the multiple forms of apocalypse we face. So my jumping off point for this paper is the sense of deep vertigo engendered by this passage in Christina Sharp's book, In the Wake. And I wanna say before I read this quote that um, I, I don't wanna assume that everybody uh, already is familiar with the term diaspora. Um, so just to very briefly kind of, um, you know, fill in if there's any questions about that, I can, we can talk about it in the chat, but also I'll just say very briefly that I'm uh, participating in the idea of diaspora that comes for, uh, first from the Jewish diaspora, but has been um, um, brought into Black studies to be thinking in terms of both dispersion, so the, 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 the dispersions of enslavement and the Middle Passage and uh, invasion in Africa, and also the continuities and differences that in here um, among people who have then had to remake home in other places and um, whose former home is no longer available, home, homeland is no longer available for various reasons. It's either literally uh, a different place now or cannot be reached. And so there's a distinction between exile and diaspora because, you know, exile uh, sort of has written into it, inscribed into it, the idea of going back, uh, of a return to a home that is still in existence and in diaspora that's not a given. Um, and certainly in diaspora, we think of it in terms of uh, some kind of violent upheaval having happened. So some kind of violent uh, relocation that is driven, it can be driven by economics, it can be driven by uh, natural disasters, it can be driven by war, by catastrophe and so on. But that the idea is that it is also not necessarily, uh, probably not a choice, probably not a voluntary sort of um, um, affirmation of, of agency in the beginning, but that agency has to be constructed and sometimes claimed, seized, remade in the process. Um, all right, so back to uh, Sharp's work. She writes, we must become undisciplined 
the work we do requires new modes and methods of research and teaching, new ways of entering and leaving the archives of slavery, of undoing the quote, racial calculus and political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago, she's quoting Saidiya Hartman, and that, and that live into the present, a kind of blackened knowledge and unscientific method that comes from observing that where one stands is relative to the door of no return and that moment of historical and ongoing rupture. With this as the ground, I've been trying to articulate a method of encountering a past that is not past. So I'd say that the unscientific method Sharp mentions inverts the familiar Western scientific method in favor of a mythopoetic science that remaps imagined landscapes and reconfigures temporality through the methodologies, histories, and knowledges of the African diaspora and I'd extend this to Native North American histories and technologies of the sacred without, uh, without uh, diffusing or um, uh, destroying the idea of difference. So uh, there may be parallels and relationships and some continuities, but at the same time, we're definitely talking about cultures that we need to keep distinct um, and histories. Um, and so another scholar I'm thinking about um, is Jock Young, who writes in The Vertigo of Late Capitalism, late modernity brings with it a sense of randomness, a chaos of reward and a chaos of identity in the area of recognition, of sense of worth and place, of ontology, there has been a parallel chaos. This is fueled by the widespread discontinuities of personal biography both in the world of work and within the family, coupled with the undermining of a sense of locality, a physical place of belonging. This disembeddedness creates an ontological insecurity, an identity crisis, the most ready response to this being the evocation of an essentialism, which asserts the core unchanging nature of oneself and others. So that was written in 2007 and you may notice that it somewhat explains, at least in some quarters, uh, the political moment we're experiencing, certainly in the US. Um, but that isn't the primary focus of what I want to talk about today. I want to call attention to Young's underscoring of a sense of randomness, disembeddedness, chaos of identity, ontological insecurity, and widespread discontinuities of personal biography, coupled with the undermining of a sense of locality. Loss of location, and here I'm thinking also about the kinds of disorientation, grief, disassociation, disembodiment, and trauma—excuse <clears throat> me, trauma-induced aphasia accompanying these various states of being dispossessed from place, ontology, and narrative. Uh, would maybe ask of you what it, it, you know, what do we think of all this uh, now in 2020? That was a long time ago that he wrote all that. Um, and I'd like to share screen right now, um, if I may, let's see, uh, just, to, just to have a visual um, as I'm going forward with the talk. So uh, let's see, pull this up here. This is a, a painting by the artist, uh, Ethiopian American artist, Julie Maretu. It's called Dervish. And so I just wanna, I'll be talking more about this as we go forward. And I just want to um, put this up for a moment right now to kind of pull together some of the threads of, of these ideas and things I'm talking about, but in a way that an artist is responding, I think in a kind of very um, uh, uh, charged uh, visual form. And I'm really interested in how, you know, the moment that we're in can render something that seems so abstract and so, um, you know, otherworldly into that uh, something that in this moment almost looks like a familiar landscape in terms of where we are emotionally, socially, and culturally. That you know the abstraction uh, is available to us as a kind of narrative of the moment that we're in. And this is also an older piece. It's it's maybe about I think um, over over ten years old. And I'm very interested in like the vertiginous quality of the work, but also want to point out the energy of it, the swirling of it, and the aggregation of figures um, within some of the, the points that you'll see um, floating above and suspended above that are informed by uh, dots and little dashes and little um, 
markings um, that Meritu speaks of as uh, citizens and subjects who come into relationship with each other, um, sometimes in, in transient and temporary modes and in motion, but who can form community and that can form intentionality and that can also act um, even within this chaotic landscape. And so there's, I think also value in thinking about like that as an available kind of imaginative landscape that some of these artists, including Maritou and other writers and even critics like the ones I mentioned are kind of looking at um, things in the past, looking at myths, looking at uh, culture stories and uh, in that proleptic move, figuring what they're looking at through this sort of engine or this vehicle of myth in a way that infuses it with possibility and in a way that like looks at cataclysm, looks at apocalypse as something that can be imbued with or seated with an intention to uh, survive and, and move forward and be able to think beyond the apocalyptic uh, kind of uh, damage and, and structural violence of these moments. So let's see. I'm gonna now uh, have to unshare my screen. Oops. Okay, I've lost my ability to unshare, hold on. Work with me, Zoom. Oh, there we go, okay. All right, so I write on the premise that as we're now seeing ourselves among hecatombs of people sacrificed to COVID, environmental catastrophe, state violence, and a continuum of anti-Black, anti-Indigenous racism, we are experiencing a state of global diaspora um, to one degree or another, and its attendant disorientations and traumas, some of us being more vulnerable than others, um, as collective context. I'm interested in how we're narrativizing this moment and how myth informs, if it does, these narratives. Add to this that uh, when Jock Young wrote, he was, he was not particularly thinking about colonized black, brown and indigenous populations that have been experiencing genocide and state violence for generations before this time. I look to the cultural production of diasporic Afro-Indigenous and Turtle Island Indigenous people who have been surviving trauma, uncertainty, psycho-spiritual dispossession, and fractured social realities to think about ways of addressing this ostensibly unprecedented time. This work investigates how Indigenous use of mythic traditions speaks to suffering from psychic displacement, chronic disorientation, and dispossession on multiple levels. And um, on the term indigenex, I, I, I um, am, am deploying that or, or, or uh, inserting that because it, precisely because Saul, it's awkward <laughs> and, and unusual. And I, 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 I feel like it can work as a signpost. I feel like it can uh, ask us in the same ways that Latinx has um, given us the precedent of, uh, you know, both having to use a term, but also questioning the term in the process and, you know, simultaneous to utilizing the term, to recognizing the history of it, to recognizing uh, the, the constructedness of it. And, and so to just a kind of um, ratchet up the tension around the terms that, that, that we deploy, particularly in uh, colonial languages. So um, here, Indigenex is also, uh, I think, signifying the thing that I'm interested in, um, in terms of inscribing the, the moment of vertigo and, and the archetype of the crossroads into becoming a kind of, being centered as a filter for which we can, for which we can um, uh, do analysis, through which we can do analysis. Um, so here we're negotiating the fact of being assaulted, traumatized, out of body, unhome, unhomed, um, dealing with economic uncertainty. And I, um, I call attention to artists addressing dislocation in particular and psycho-spiritual dislocation. What I'm seeing is that African and native North American indigenous derived artists utilize mythic archetypes, including Oshun, the Yoruba goddess of love and erotic energy associated with Ashe, life force 
and the corn maiden, uh, which is a native North American uh, archetype um, as paradigms of proleptic futurity. And uh, I'm borrowing the term proleptic futurity from the critic uh, Kajo Asun, Eshun, who writes in Further Considerations of Afrofuturism, um, the artist might reassemble the predatory futures that insist the next years will be ones of unmitigated despair. Um, Afrofuturism then is concerned with the possibilities for intervention within the dimension of the predictive, the projected, the proleptic, the envisioned, the virtual, the anticipatory, and the future conditional. And his work goes on to talk about Drexia and its uh, redeployment of Paul Gil Gilroy's conception of the Black Atlantic um, as a science fiction, which is then developed through uh, uh, analysis of migration and mutation. Um, and so that goes on um, with that idea of bringing the myth into the present in a way that su supports and um, promotes the ability to survive, the ability to even conceive of a future at all. Um, so borrowing proleptic intervention as a kind of program or software that creates the future by reconfiguring the past and memory, I argue these works draw on myth to reconfigure love, not as romantic or filial love only, but as an intervention that secures a healing and empowering balance amid vertiginously disorienting conditions. Diasporic artists, critics, and writers have been for generations utilizing mythic archetypes to effect new ontological possibilities that serve futurist imperatives of acclimating to shifting selves, communities, and ecologies. And I uh, turn to work by diasporic and indigenous, indigenous neo-diasporic critics, writers, and artists across genres, including Julie Meritu, uh, whose work you just saw. I'm also looking in popular culture at uh, uh, artists like Beyonce. So, one Jimmy. minute left. All right, thank you. Uh, and critics, uh, including Sylvia Winter and uh, uh, Toni Morrison, both as writer and critic, and uh, also Leslie Silco and Deborah Miranda uh, with her book, Bad Indians. Uh, when a text comes with evidence on display, is a final point I'll leave you with, uh, of an orientation toward proleptic futurity framed as love and healing. It invariably works to inspire decolonial imaginings, displaying an intention you can see built into the language, image, structure, and elusive resonances. Uh, they may even be working in some cases to generate neurochemical and somatic responses in audiences, as well as relying on intellectual and political responses. These texts are healing, among other things, the Western binary that places mind in opposition to body, reclaims and reconfigures body and ontology with an eye toward imagining a new self, and helps us adapt to unlimited futurities while remaining grounded through myth as technology of self-knowing and uh, inscribing the ability to transmit these somatic and imaginative knowledges to our futures. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've been very precise, 20 minutes. I'm very pleased. Uh, thank you for your interesting paper about um, so many things, uh, Afrofuturism, which I wasn't familiar with, and uh, this displacement and this dispossession. I took a few notes. It's very new to me and I'm very interested in, in new things. Uh, and uh, you taught me a new term. Uh, I still don't know, if I know how to pronounce it. Indigen X, is it? Indigen yeah. X. Yes. Well, you see, I'm learning. Okay. So uh, <laughs> questions are <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> so questions are open and I already see one here. Uh, this is uh, coming from Metka. Um, she says, thank you for emphasizing the possibility of moving beyond the apocalypse, regardless of the obstacles and various forms of challenges and suffering. Thank you for that comment. Um, I. Uh... I, I, I appreciate you underscoring that point. And I guess I'm thinking, you know, just to comment briefly in response, I'm thinking and I'm drawn to um, people who are doing work that helps us to, to, to find a way of uh, utilizing myth in this moment. And, and I think I mentioned in the paper, you know, um, the idea of how we are narrativizing because we're in a time of tragedy, you know what the one I, I was reflecting this morning on the fact that the one thing that really unites us globally right now in an interesting way is 
the fact that we all have a tragic story that we're sharing um, in one way or another. So, you know, I look to the cultures that have already been thinking about apocalypse and having to deal with apocalypse for uh, what their approaches are, what the methodologies are and, and what their ways of imagining are because these are cultures that have historically gone on to survive and thrive, you know. Um, the people who at the beginning of the 19th century at the turn of the, at, at the turn of the 19th and, and even into the 20th century who who the writing about them that was coming from uh, the colonial world was that they were that we were all destined to uh, expire you know that we were destined to become extinct and that uh, you know that Native Americans were uh, considered vanishing Americans uh, literally, it was in the language, it was also in the policy um, that, uh, you know, that Black people could not make it in the future and could not be acclimated to a world of modernity and progress, even though slavery was actually the groundwork of, of modernity. So, you know, thank you for that. Uh, it's a long conversation. Oh, well, let me read another. Uh, yeah, there's a comment, Silicon uh, from Metka. By the way, my own intent and orientation when I presented on Wing Wenders, dot, 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 <laughs> ellipses. Hmm. Well, thank you. I, we do have things. I love them, vendors. We have a lot to talk about. I hope we will. Hmm. Any, more, any more questions? Perhaps a few comments? Let's see if a few questions might arrive. Don't be shy. Silence is silence. I'm just wondering. Nobody? If you have questions or comments, write them in the chat, please. Oh, there's one. It takes time to write comments. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> I'm the impatient one. I'm the impatient one, my fault. Well, let's, let us give them a little bit more time. Uh, we actually have some time for a few more questions. Well, it was very interested in your comparison between exile and diaspora. Yeah, that was a very clear explanation of it. I'm grateful that you said that. Uh, the idea that diaspora is not a given, whereas the exile is the idea of going back. So yeah, I, I appreciated the clarity with which you explained that. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. yeah. Valerie, are there are there other myths that you you work with in uh, in your work? I found oh. you know the, the the indigenous ones that you mentioned um, um, quite compelling. I'm just wondering what some of the other ones are. Oh, uh, definitely. You know, I I thank you for the question, Bradley. I I came to doing this work um, through work that I've done on Toni Morrison who is deeply invested in myth and, um, you know, her, her novels kind of really constitute a, an archive I've discovered along the way, as have other people. Uh, so one of the things uh, recently that I was doing with my students was um, a kind of close reading of a passage in Beloved, where uh, the main character, Setha, um, who is the mother of the child, uh, that you know that that is uh, killed by by matricide and then haunted by the child's spirit uh, returning. Um, there's a scene where Setha and her husband um, on the plantation while they're still enslaved um, go out to the cornfield next to the slave quarters because they don't want to consummate their love inside of the building that is the slave quarters. And so my students were really um, 
you know, well, first of all, they were like clutching their pearls over a sex scene in Toni Morrison, but it's uh, really written with an emphasis on like the erotic and on like the, you know, the, the, the textures, the, the, the sounds, the sonic landscape. And then I realized along the way that she's actually drawing on the corn maiden uh, myth that comes from Native American, North American, it, it shows up in a lot of different uh, cultural traditions, this, this corn mother or the corn maiden, who's a figure of wisdom. And it is a healing moment. The lovemaking is, although it's written in sort of this erotic form, um, it's not a pornographic form, right, which is, is a, it needs to be said but that it is like a, a sacred moment of uh, being able to, to recollect uh, the sense of self into the body and to affirm the body. And so it's reflected also against later, a, a, a different point in the novel where the character Baby Suggs is holding a, uh, a ceremony in a, in a, in a, um, a kind of a, a green place, uh, an outdoors place where people who are ex-slaves come together to worship and to just celebrate um, their sense of like being together as a community. But she is a kind of lay preacher and she, she walks the, the, the gathering, everyone in the crowd through a ritual of, of dance and movement and song where she is in, in, instilling them with the idea you have to love yourself part by part, like you have to love your legs, you have to love your feet, you have to love your uh, sex organs, you have to love your arms, your hands, your face, your tongue, your, your mouth. She really remaps and reconnects these fragmented uh, bodies, these abused, um, um, distorted bodies that have been just reduced to their labor, um, that have been dehumanized, and that have been seen as non-sentient and, and, not, and not spiritually uh, alive. And so it's a moment of enlivening and of, of using these, uh, the, the different traditions. I mean, Morrison, I think is really adept at um, syncretizing and synthesizing different traditions. So it is sometimes shocking for my students um, and in conversations and with Morrison scholars, you know, to talk about that she's she's definitely using African American folklore and mythology, African diasporic, so Caribbean, um, West African, Central African tropes, but she's also using the mythology of the place that she's talking about. And so these are people who are in Kentucky and Ohio, but where um, the Oshun archetype shows up, Yamaya shows up, uh, Eshu, um, the Yoruba trickster figure is definitely always with Morrison's work. And I think there, are, well, I'm going on too long, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> okay, well, I wasn't about to interrupt you. I would have left you another 30 seconds, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was very illuminating. I hope I answered your question. Oh, that was, that was a wonderful answer. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. So, um, next speaker. Uh, so, our next speaker, um, her name is uh, Ana Martin Castillejos. Uh, she's a senior lecturer of the Department of Applied Linguistics, uh, ETS AM UPM. She taught at MSU USA Faculty of Architecture in Chile and in Tongji, Shanghai, uh, a member of SIIM. Uh, UCM, uh, Locus, the Universita, uh, Universita Politecnica de Madrid, and a member of Rebedi Toller Board, uh, UCJC. Uh, research lines are cultural and space studies with emphasis on women. Uh, today, uh, Anna Martin Casiecos uh, uh, is going to present a paper entitled Blade Runner's Architectural Legacy. Please. Can you hear us, Anna, Anna Martin? Are you there? I, I can't. Anna? But, yeah. Um, yeah, wonderful. Please start. Um, I would like to show you um, a PowerPoint. Uh, and I think that I need to be the host to in order to do that. Can I show you? No, you just need to share your screen. Sorry? 
All you need to do is to share your screen. Okay. Let me see how can I do that. Basically, you need to click on, oh, that, that's it. That's correct. Okay. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Can you see my screen? Because uh, I can. Yes. Uh, yes, I but I don't see a PowerPoint and just see shapes. Oh, yeah, that's it. I can see it now. Yeah. And, uh, but is it like um, in big size or? Yeah. Uh, you need to. I don't know what I need to do. Yeah, like full screen, I think. Full screen. One second. Yeah, I think I so. Slideshow, actually. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Bradley. <laughs> um, yeah, excuse me. What did you say? How can I make it like larger? There's a, there should be, um, if you go up into file, you might find slideshow up there, or there's a little icon down in the lower right that looks like you know, a days, um, and if you press that, it might go into slideshow. Oh. So, but I'm well, not, I'm not seeing that icon on here. I don't know why. Yeah, from here we can, oh, like we this? cannot oh, okay. see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So this is what I'm going to to, to tell you about this uh, this evening. Architecture as myth in Blade Runner. Uh, Blade Runner is still considered as one of the best science, science fiction films for the May. Set in 2019 Los Angeles, the film shows how cutting edge genetic engineering and bionic technology have developed to produce replicants more human than human. Beside the relationship established between humans and replicants, which raises questions about the boundaries of what is ethical, the film offers a deep insight into the future of architecture and urbanism. Replicants can be manipulated to live forever, but this myth of eternity also appears embodied in the architecture of the film, where we see an accumulation of styles from high tech to brutalism or to cyberpunk. This paper seeks to show the power of architecture in a film to provide science fiction settings. The runner laid the foundations for the futuristic dystopian city, even with his countless references to the past. This look back and forth in time is what helped create the myth of eternity that runs parallel with that of the replicants. Vivian Scott said that Blade Runner, one second, um, said that Blade, Blade Runner was a movie set 40 years later and made in the style of 40 years ago. Perhaps this is the premise that best defines how much the aesthetics and the design of Blade Runner encompasses. Even the story itself borrows a lot from the classic uh, film narrative of the 40s and, and 50s, introducing archetypal elements such as the hero of questionable morals or the femme fatale. The film's artistic design largely reflect Ridley Scott's own concerns. In fact, he was actively involved in the design, sorry, in the design. As Scott well describes this process of creation and artistic design was based on a previous exploration of influences artistic and um, sorry artists and illustrators which would later de uh, be developed in the film the sources and artistic influences that come together in blade runner and its aesthetics are many and disparate we can see influences from howard the vermeer uh jacob reese edward hooper perhaps some of the more tangible 
perhaps some of these uh, influences are more tangible than others, but somehow all of them are present, giving rise to the hodgepodge of references uh, that are genuine and chaotic, which constantly sorry, look to the past to speculate about the future. <clears throat> Perhaps one of the most influential references for Scott was the French graphic art magazine Metal Harlan and the work of the cartoonist Moebius, particularly his comic The Long Tomorrow. The publication was full of uh, was full of wild urban scenes in which the familiar and the fantastic were just opposed and whose essence would be assumed and projected in the drawings of the visual artist of Blade Runner, Sid Met. Sid Met was an illustrator and designer and had previously worked in the automobile industry and later on in the design of Star Trek. <clears throat> Met was initially hired to design the vehicles for the film for Blade Runner, given his experience in the film. However, Scott liked him so much that uh, Met intervened in many aspects of the film. Met contributed uh, his particular vision of the future, characterized by the latent presence of the present and the past in his future projections, as well as the apparent viability of his creations. In fact, Blade Runner exuded truthfulness, a future rooted in experience of the past. Without any doubt, Scott's extensive search for the past, for past artistic and architectural references to imagine Blade Runner universe would consolidate a new and influential speculative resource in later cinema. Anna, can you please double click on your presentation? Maybe that will help. Just double click. If I double click. Yeah, double click, please. But can you see it? Can, can you see my presentation? Yes, but it's, uh, it's not like maximize. If you try to double click on it, it might do the trick. Um, but, but I have done it. I have that double clicked. And the only thing that I, that I do is that um, I, I get like a new, uh, a new screen, but uh, I mean, I can see properly. Can you? No. Uh, well, we we see that you share the screen, but we only see one slide. Were you? Uh, did you try to share more slides? Okay. That's what it. Just go on slide. Yeah, now it's good. Go to yeah. the slideshow. Slideshow, well. please. Yes, this is what I did before, and it didn't work. Now we can see. Yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much. Please carry on. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Um, okay. So I was going to to speak about the influence of um, of uh, high tech archigram on the Lloyd Building in the, in. Um, Blade Runner. The dominant strategy in the design of the future of Blade Runner was what became known as retrofitting, defined by Sid Met as updating or improving all machinery or structures with the addition of new as as uh, accessories. This concept was applicable mainly to everything that appeared in the film, furniture, vehicles, clothes, and buildings, of course. The approach to the future as feedback from the past presupposes a dynamic and changing present, which integrates layers and more layers, which with the passing of time are becoming past. Uh, it is therefore a simple extreme reflection of reality. If we think about most of today's cities, they are exactly like this. But in Blade Runner, we get like an as exaggeration of this um, of these layers upon layers. How he envisioned the streets and buildings of the city of Blade Runner, the buildings would just become surfaces where electrical uh, appliances could be plugged on, pipes, air conditioning duct, and all kinds of, en of elements. The energy would come from a generator located on the street, which can be, uh, sorry, which could be there for years. And then these big cables 
that uh, that the wood run down the side of all the buildings. It had to look like what it was. And what it was, it was a city whose individual structures had been absorbed into some kind of urban machine with people living inside. Um, uh, reading the description, it is impossible not to evoke the architecture that was produced by high tech in, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, Richard Rogers was an, a, a, a fundamental sort of inspiration in uh, retrofitting and high tech, uh, coinciding with a turning point uh, in terms of technological development. Uh, technology had reached homes. It was no longer something intangible and reserved for industry. Suddenly, technology was available for everyone, for washing machines, refrigerators, everything. The response of architecture to this social and technological change is evident in the proposals of the Artigram group. These were not realistic proposals. Uh, they were just suggestive images, typical of science fiction scenes in a comic. The importance of, it, of these drawings and the great repercussion uh, that they got was that they were repul uh, revulsive and transgressive and that they um, uh, help create a new type of architecture. Um, some of the best uh, known examples were Peter Cook's plugin city that we have seen here, uh, which proposed a city that could move and um, sorry, not, not that that was completely it was uh, plugged. Um, I mean, every, everybody could could plug everything on, on these buildings and run everyone's walking city that was a city that could walk. Archigram speculations and proposals were not properly tangible architecture. Um, uh, nevertheless, they borrow technology, they, they make architects to borrow technologies from other films for their buildings. For instance, Richard Rogers, Michael Hopkins, or Nicholas Grinshaw would begin to work injecting that spirit of archigram science fiction fantasies into the, their own architecture, giving rise uh, to the birth of high tech. These are some examples. The main prefect of this new style were the preferential use of synthetic material, mainly steel and glass, rather than natural materials, a, um, a consequent uh, prevalence of prefabricated elements and prefabricated structures. Likewise, they defended a code of honesty in expression, renouncing to deceptive structures or false facades. And with regard to space, they advocated large and flexible spaces ignoring the traditional functional distribution. In that sense, the Lloyd Building or the Pompidou Center redirect us at first glance to the aesthetics of Blade Runner. The concept of the proposal for the Center Pompidou was the exhibition of the entire infrastructure of the building. The skeleton, the skeleton itself envelops the building from the outside, revealing all the structure which contains a system of color code coded pipes and conduits that make us the, the sorry that make up the building's facade. What has traditionally been hidden is exposed and becomes an ornament. This aesthetic, so brutal and, and almost aggressive, is glimpsed in the urban landscapes of Bay Runner designed by Met. The accumulation of layers of constructive elements that appear in Blade Runner was not accidental. Um, uh, really Scott's fascination for the Lois building is very present in all the film. Um, um, uh, Scott tried to get a look that, closely, that, that was closely linked to futurism. Uh, Blade Runner would also integrate in this eclectic conglomerate a series of his historicist elements and article references, which in turn would introduce another current architectural trend, postmodernism. Postmodernism, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 1980s, architecture was still here to the unifying wave of the modern movement. The modern movement was born as a stimulus against the dogmatism of the historic, historicist tradition. However, 
uh, it ended up transforming its anti-dogmatism into a new doc dogmatism, uh, symbiotic with the industrial system and adapted to, fun to functional, sorry, functionalist principles. The philosophy of the modern movement could be summarized by the Corbusier famous The House is a Machine for Living. The choice of artificial materials and that link with the universe of the, of the machine characterized functionalist architecture. However, like any other stylistic current, the modern movement would eventually reach its decline. And around the 60s and 70s, dissonant minorities began to emerge. Postmodern architecture was, therefore, born as a revulsive reaction against the constraint of the modern movement, against the dogmas of um, formal aesthetics, purity, and the absence of any vulgar, vulgar element. Postmodernist architecture revalues, re, revalues ambiguity and irony, the plurality of styles and the double code, which allows it to address both popular and traditional taste, but also profes the professional palette. The new postmodern trend recovers collective memory as a very powerful tool, again, making contact with historical and traditional memory and imposing the need for the establishment of a binding relationship between new buildings and the environment where the buildings are. With regards to Blade, to Blade Runner, the, the, uh, the film is framed in a context marked by the dominant presence of postmodern architecture. And this stylistic preeminence is reflected in the architecture of the film. In the 60s and 70s, architects such as Louis Kahn, Robert Venturi, or Charles Moore would shape the new wave of postmodern architecture. Learning from Las Vegas, document and investigate the urban dispersion and the mess of representation of Las Vegas, carefully studying the symbolism of a city built ex novo without any trust or uh, any trace on which to look. A fantasy city whose neon billboards and literal architecture make it a kind of fictional urban space. Um, Many of these ideas function as conceptual ingredients for uh, Scott's film, whose city full of billboards and neon light is seen as, um, as um, another Las Vegas somehow. Learning from Las Vegas speaks about the persuasive power of advertising and its integration, uh, the integration of this advertising, uh, advertising um, in the, the urban landscape of the city. Returning to more general aesthetic aspect of uh, Blade Runner, in Scott film, the city stands tall as, the, as an imposing monster, which has been fitted back and integrating layers and more layers to its skeleton until it becomes a great conglomerate. Um, the film um, offers a chaotic and urban, um, and, uh, sorry, a chaotic and urbanistically failed uh, aspect of, of, um, of uh, a modern city. However, between the disorder and chaos of this dystopia lies a great vitality. There is a moment in the film where there is, um, sorry, where it is presented as an infinite mosaic of lights with immense fire chimneys that evoke a, medie a medieval feudal aspect, possibly alluding to the so socioeconomic pessimism of the future of our society. Sorry, one minute left, please. Only one minute. Yeah, um, sorry. What can I say? Because I, I knew that my, my paper was too long. Um, OK. In the city of Lee Runner 2019, eclecticism and the overlapping of styles are very present through tons of neons and advertisement endorsing the facades. The city is converted into, into a advertising showcase, hyperdensified and relegated to an absolute artificiality, where, where what is important is the consumer claims. There is also a clear uh, trend towards Asianization that reveals the prevailing fear of Japanese thermo technological dominance at the time. The birth of cyberpunk aesthetics is also present in Blade Runner. Um, there are also two, two aspects that I would like to mention. 
the concept of retrofitting that, that, that I have also that I have already explained before, and also the concept of um, multiculturalism, multiculturalism that is present in the movie. Uh, the collision of one's own culture and foreign cultures commonly leads to this dissolution and uprooting of both cultures, giving shape to the great cosmopolitan capitals of our era. The, the film, despite narrating the decline of a post-apocalyptic world, addresses the issues of globalization from an attitude of veiled optimism. Uh, the inclusion of the ornamental elements of Wright's Ennis House is not only a reference to the city of Los Angeles, where the city is, and where the setting of the, pro the plot is also supposed to be, but it is also linked to the to the multicultural image of the city. The final, the final, uh, one second, one second. I think that I'm going to, to jump to the, to the very end. The final climax, the, the final climax of Blade Runner 2019 comes with Royce chase after Deckard to the top floor of a decrepit and shadowy building that is, uh, this is the property building that is a real building in Los Angeles. Um, along with the Ennis House, it is one of the very few locations in, in, the, in the city where the scenes from the film, from the film were real. Architecture is a powerful tool while the plot monopolizes the viewer, the scenography uh, goes along with the action in a Latin way, silently releasing a large amount of information. The buildings of Blade Runner are a rich conglomeration of artistic references in a more abstract sense and of architectural elements in a literal sense. This architectural paroxysm reveals the qualities of a historical moment in which aesthetics and conceptual ideals stand, stand out, such as those posed by eclectic postmodernists and by high tech. And there is an analogous process experienced by society in terms of freedoms and breaking of dogmas. We believe that the elaborate and successful format Excel and the skillful combination of iconographic elements decontextualized over time are perhaps the, 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 the keys that have made Blade Runner a cult film. Thank you for the extra time because I know that that, that I have uh, used more time than I should. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, uh, perhaps we'll have a bit less time for the questions, but there is still time for a few questions. Thank you very much for your paper. I see. Yes, I see here from Asuncion Lopez Verela Zacarte. Well, I shall read it to you. One of the biggest tropes in cyberpunk is that democracy breaks down and is replaced by corporate power. How is this representing the city in Blade Runner and how does it relate to transhumanism? Many thanks. How, can, can you repeat the question? Uh, the, uh, the, the, um, it, Do you want me to repeat it? it? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. So I'll read it again then. One of the biggest tropes tropes in cyberpunk is that democracy breaks down and is replaced by corporate power. How is this represented in the city in Blade Runner? And how does it relate to transhumanism? Um, the end of, tra of the democracy. In fact, I have not thought about that. How, how is the end of democracy por portrays? Uh, I, I, I can't see that, uh, that the end of democracy is portrayed in Blade Runner, in fact. I don't think so. In fact, uh, even in the, in the very optimism and ending of the movie, you can see that there is some hope for uh, freedom. Um, um, sorry, but excuse, I, I, excuse, excuse me, I, I my apologies for... My apologies for interrupting you. If you stop sharing your screen, it will be easier to communicate, I think. You just stop oh, okay. sharing the screen, please. Oh, okay. Thank you. Well, what, what I was saying is that uh, I, I don't think that, uh, that the, the end of democracy is, is very clearly portrayed in Blade Runner. I think that there are other issues that are more important than, than this one, in fact. 
And also, as I said before, the ending is like there is some escape. I mean, there is some, uh, you know, we still have some kind of some, some hope. Are there any comments about this or further questions, please? So uh, she says, uh, Marisuncion Lopez Verela Zacarte says, thanks, about the buildings my stage some of the concerns with power. Thanks. Yes, uh, this, is, this is true. In fact, uh, Tidal Corporation um, is, uh, portrays very clearly the, the power in the, in the, in the movie. Uh, and is uh, in fact where one of the more relevant, more one of the most uh, important scenes uh, of the movie takes place. In um, I think that uh, um, I don't know if I got to show you the the, the image of this Tarot Corporation, but it's a pyramid, and the pyramid is an example of is 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 is, is a simplify is is an example of power in architecture. Um, so yes, um, um, po power, po political power is portrayed through architecture in, in the movie. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, perhaps one very short question and then we need to, uh, to say goodbye, unfortunately. Okay, so I wanted to thank uh, Bradley, Valerie, and Dana for their presentations. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, and um, yeah, well done. <laughs> thank you. Thank actually, you. So thank you. Nice to meet you, actually. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Saul, for moderating the session, and thank you so much, Bradley, thank you. Valerie, and Anna for joining us with your thank you, interesting presentations. And thank you also to um, all of those who have followed us online. And we are going to end this and close this uh, conference. Uh, we'll have a few words uh, at seven o'clock with uh, Jose Manuel and all the organizing committee. If you if you want to to uh, uh, be uh, following that on online. Uh, but otherwise, thank you so much for, for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Nice meeting you. Bye bye.